Imagine you have a bathtub with the faucet turned on. The bathtub is quickly filling up with water and right before it starts overflowing, somebody comes with a bucket and tries to empty it. If he puts a lot of effort, he may be fast enough to get most of the water out of the bathtub, but for how long will that last? Not much, of course, because in no time, the water coming from the open faucet will fill up the tub again. The weight loss diet shelf at any bookstore is filled with many different popular books, each proposing a different approach or a different method. Some of them propose a low-carb approach, some other focus on high proteins or low fat or particular macronutrient ratios, particular association of foods, particular distinctions of good and bad foods, and so on. The truth of the matter is, most of these weight loss diets work if you follow them. There is a simple rule of thumb for these popular diets. If they are popular, it's because they work. A weight loss diet book wouldn't sell millions of copies if it didn't make you lose weight. But when it comes to keep your weight down after the diet is over, all of these popular diets suddenly become useless. They miserably fail because there is an inherent limitation to any weight loss diet by itself. A weight loss diet alone is like the bucket with which our poor friend was trying to empty the filling bathtub. It is an emergency tool, but it's not a real solution to the problem. A weight loss diet is completely useless if it is not accompanied by a lifelong change of dietary habits and lifestyle. Without that, once the weight loss diet is over, our old eating habits and lifestyle that made us gain weight in the first place will make us gain weight again in no time, just like the open faucet was quickly refilling the tub after it was emptied. The real solution for the bathtub problem, of course, is to turn off the faucet. The real solution for the weight control problem is changing lifestyle and dietary habits. For a lot of people, a weight loss diet is a period of struggle and deprivation during which food intake is severely restricted with the goal of losing a few pounds, at which point they are happy and they assume it's perfectly okay to go back to normal and resume eating anything they like just the way they were doing before. Inevitably, this makes them gain weight again, and so they are soon back to square one and the cycle begins. This alternation of weight gain and weight loss periods is what we call weight cycling or yo-yo dieting. Unfortunately, although when we overeat we mostly accumulate fat, when we lose weight we cannot lose only fat. We will also have to lose some lean mass together with it, which is the main reason why yo-yo dieting is very bad. Every time we gain weight, what we gain is fat. But every time we lose weight, we also inevitably lose some bones and muscle as well. So the first important concept to always remember is that a weight loss diet by itself is never a solution to the problem of weight control. And it is completely useless if dietary habits and lifestyle changes are not implemented together with it. Before working with the bucket, we must turn the faucet off. With that in mind, we can now proceed to examine the prerequisites of a sound weight loss diet. Indeed, we cannot judge a weight loss diet only by how much and how fast it makes us lose weight. There are other important parameters as well. The very first requirement of any weight loss diet is that it must be healthy. Losing weight and fat can never be done at the price of general health. If we lose weight but destroy our body in the process, we will not have accomplished anything good. In particular, a weight loss diet must meet all nutritional needs and cannot cause malnutrition. If the diet requires a period of caloric restriction so strict that an adequate intake of micronutrients is impossible, a multivitamin and multimineral supplement must be used. Another key requirement of a weight loss diet as you know very well by now, is that it makes you lose primarily fat. Suppose you go to the grocery store and a young clerk greets you with enthusiasm and says, I have an incredible deal for you today. I'll sell you 10 pounds for just $1.99. I bet your immediate reply would be, I'm sorry, 10 pounds of what? The very same question should come just as naturally to you when you hear about a miraculous diet that promises to make you lose 10 pounds in just one week. 10 pounds of what? Losing 10 pounds of water, 10 pounds of muscle, or 10 pounds of bones would not be much of a result. What you really want to lose on a weight loss diet is 10 pounds of fat. 
We already know that losing only fat is unfortunately not possible, but we certainly want to make sure that what we lose on a weight loss diet is primarily fat, while minimizing muscle and bone losses, and without getting too excited for losses of water. And when we lose fat, we can reasonably expect to lose one to two, sometimes three or four pounds a week, but no more than that. Anything more than that is probably not fat. And let's not forget that losing too much weight too fast can be very dangerous because it just disrupts thousands of metabolic pathways and may release toxic compounds that our body had sequestered in the adipose tissue. People have died because of it. We then have another set of requirements that are important to increase the feasibility of the weight loss diet, thus maximizing chances of compliance and avoiding the risk of giving up after just a few days. The diet must be flexible. Our life is complicated. We may not have a lot of time to cook or shop for food. We may have to eat lunch at work, to eat out at the restaurant, to travel. And we still need to be able to make our diet work. 20 years ago, most weight loss diets were simply lists of food to eat at every meal. One may have read something like Sunday breakfast, one cup of skim milk and one slice of whole grain bread with two tablespoons of strawberry jam, lunch, 60 grams of pasta with broccoli, 80 grams of chicken breast and one apple, and so on Sunday through Saturday and then all over again. We now are well aware that such an approach is a recipe for disaster. If you had to eat out at the restaurant and they didn't have the 80 grams of chicken breast with lemon, you didn't know what to do and you felt frustrated because you had to come up with an alternative and you felt you were not complying with the instructions that you were given. And what if you didn't feel like eating pasta with broccoli at lunch on Monday? A diet like that just makes you miserable. It's impossible to follow and it soon becomes boring and repetitive anyway. A diet is not a list of foods to eat Sunday through Saturday. Rather, it's a series of concepts that you need to know and understand well so you can make appropriate choices on your own. Planning meals may then make it easier if you feel like it, but you must be prepared to make changes and adjustments whenever needed without the feeling that you're messing up the diet. The diet must also be acceptable. It must accommodate the individual habits and tastes. It cannot make your life miserable. Because if you're only allowed to eat chicken breast, salad and steamed carrots, it may make you lose weight, but it will soon drive you crazy. You don't necessarily have to give up all your favorite foods. If there are foods you cannot stand or foods that you cannot live without, your diet must take into account that as well. You cannot impose a low-carb diet to somebody who can't live without bread, and you cannot prescribe grapefruit juice for breakfast to somebody who hates grapefruit. The diet must then be reasonable, both as regards to the rate of weight loss and the choice of food. It should promote a reasonably slow but steady weight loss and emphasize food that is reasonably easy to find and prepare. It cannot keep you hungry, because if you are hungry, you eat and there's no way around it. It should not require to weigh food or make nutrient calculations because eating with scales and calculator is extremely bothersome and again, most people soon give up. Finally, the diet must be sufficiently varied. It cannot be based on just one food or a very limited selection and it cannot require you to eat the same things over and over again or even every week. It must include all nutrients, all food categories and be as varied as possible. This is not only to ensure it's healthy and nutritionally adequate, but also improves compliance. Eating the same things over and over again, yes, it promotes specific satiety, so people tend to eat less calories, but it soon becomes boring and most people just give up. So to recap, a safe and effective weight loss diet must be generally healthy, meet all nutritional needs, and the weight loss must come primarily from fat. It must be sufficiently flexible, it must be acceptable, and it must be reasonable. It cannot keep you hungry, it shouldn't require to weigh food or make nutrient calculations, and it must be sufficiently varied. Once these prerequisites are met, there are many different approaches that can be followed to design a weight loss diet. All of them have pros and cons, but their discussion goes beyond the scope of this introductory nutrition course. Suffice to say that there is no one single ideal approach. 
Not every diet works for every person, and their choice depends on individual needs as well as preferences, eating habits, and degree of motivation. How much weight must be lost? What are the causes of overweight or obesity? We already know that they can be dietary factors, meaning foods we choose and the amounts we eat, metabolic factors, that is how our body responds to what we are eating, since different individuals respond differently, even if they eat the same food, and psychosocial factors, which determine why we are eating the way we are eating, what motivates us to eat, how do we feel when we eat, do we eat in response to stress, to emotions, do we have a food addiction, and so on. Only when we understand the causes, we can find the best solutions. In general, however, there are a few points that are common to most weight loss diets. It must have a negative energy balance, that is, the calories you spend must be more than the calories you eat, and by now we know very well why there cannot be any other way to lose weight. Meals must have a low glycemic load to prevent insulin peaks. This can be accomplished by avoiding high glycemic index foods such as added sugar, refined cereals, and potatoes, or by combining them with foods rich in fiber such as veggies and legumes to slow down sugar absorption. The intake of saturated fats, trans fats, and cooked fats should be reduced. The diet must focus on proteins, unsaturated fats, complex carbs, and fiber from whole grains and legumes, fresh fruit and vegetables. Intake of alcohol must be extremely limited because it provides a lot of empty calories. Use of low energy density foods such as fiber rich foods or soups should be promoted to increase satiation. Energy expenditure must also be increased and this can best be accomplished with physical activity. And last but not least, any weight loss plan must also include an appropriate strategy for behavior modification based on the assessment of the psychosocial factors which drive our eating behavior. We have already discussed previously in our course how we can approach the problem of changing eating behavior.